Okay, hi. Um, today's talk here is going to be about T. Colin Campbell, uh, Nutrition Hero number 12. And I would sort of rank the nutrition experts among the living and the deceased. I got three of each. McDougal, and I'll go by what they emphasize in their career. So McDougal, probably the best living nutrition doctor, he emphasizes carbohydrates, recommending everybody eat starch. And that's an important thing. If you just eat a lot of starch and you don't even know anything else, you'll probably do pretty well. Okay, and then the of the deceased great nutrition experts, Burkett also promoted eating, you know, complex carbohydrates or high fiber foods. So he said definitely avoid the refined carbohydrates where they take in the fiber out like the flour. So I sort of see McDougal and Burkett as going together on the carbohydrate emphasis among nutrition experts. Then when you talk about lipids, I see Esselstyn amongst the active ones and Pritikin amongst the deceased nutrition experts, the two best ones in that area. Esselstyn is real famous for saying no oil, not one drop. And Pritikin was quite famous for saying fat is bad. And they both really emphasized as a key aspect of their diets is minimizing intake of fat. And then the best of the protein experts amongst the living is T. Colin Campbell. Um, he did wonderful, incredible work, deserves a Nobel Prize for figuring out that animal protein is a major tumor promoter, especially casein, but animal promoter in general. Animal protein has a different amino acid composition than does plant protein. Animal protein has more leucine, more methionine, more lysine, and these tend to be rate-limiting steps for the activation of growth pathways that can stimulate tumor growth. Um, the best expert amongst the deceased great nutrition experts would be uh, Walter Kempner. And Kepner had been a nutrition researcher with tissue culture for kidneys. So he, was, he also was trained by Otto Warburg, the, the one who figured out uh, about impairment of mitochondrial respiration due to hypoxia being the key causative factor uh, for cancers. And he even felt it was the prime cause of cancer, the essential. Um, but getting back to that, Kempner, after studying a lot of kidney tissue, came to the conclusion, gee, he's going to go with the rice diet. Um, because he needs to quite a bit lower protein. And he got incredibly good results in these patients. That was back before the days of dialysis. He had a lot of patients who would have been dead for sure, and he was able to maintain their kidney function for a long time by minimizing their level of dietary protein. The amount of protein in rice about 5%. And then he would superimpose upon that uh, fruits, fruit juice um, as waste. And even he, he'd even let the patients eat just sugar, sucrose, because he wanted something that had no protein and no nitrogen. That's the main job of the kidney, is to manage nitri nitrogen. So if you want to make life easier for the kidney, you minimize the nitrogen intake, and you also uh, minimize uh, acidic foods. Okay, so T. Colin Campbell, with all his great achievements, you think he's a big hero at his university? No. <laughs> they tried to fire him uh, from Cornell, and that's because, you know, the, some of the other industries that donate money to the school also are producing, you know, animal product foods. So they're probably less than thrilled by him saying that uh, animal protein uh, increases cancer risk. Um, luckily, he had tenure, so they couldn't fire him, but they tried to. They took his picture down from the wall in the conference, um, conference room. Um, and the other thing I've noticed is none of the nutrition doctors are in all the textbooks. I, I've gone through tons of textbooks looking at what's in there. Uh, the only one who's in there is Burkitt for his uh, work on the lymphoma, which was named after him, Burkitt's lymphoma. But for his nutritional work, abdominal pressure syndrome, uh, that's not in any of the, the medical student textbooks. Um, his book, here's a, T. Colin Campbell's book, The China Study. This is the best version of it. It's copyright 2016 revised and expanded edition. He basically you know, goes through his own research with regard to animal protein tumor promoters in mice, and then subsequently his impressions on how that correlated with humans in the China study, you know, a massive uh, epidemiologic study there in the 1980s and whatnot on uh, the populations in China in the 1970s and 80s, incredible opportunity. And he kind of summarizes you know, his perspective on different diseases and what he's seen. Uh, this is a great book. It's one of the all-time best nutrition books. So that one is one you're definitely worth reading. He's got lots of videos online. It's good to watch them. Um, what else about him? So what were some of his, his insights? That when the mice 
we're exposed to aflatoxin. Aflatoxin is the carcinogen that occurs in moldy peanut butter. Aflatoxin increases the risk of an animal developing liver cancer. And what he said was the moldy peanuts were the ones that tended to get used for peanut butter because you're not going to want to eat those. You don't want to look at them and eat them. Uh, but anyways, when aflatoxin was combined with 5% casein, casein is the milk protein, it's about 80% of the protein in, in milk, whey is like another uh, milk protein. Anyways, 5% casein combined with aflatoxin, mice had no cancer. However, when you combine the aflatoxin with 20% casein, almost all of them got cancer, like 100%. And then they did the same thing with mice that had um, HBV, hepatitis B virus. This time it was about 6% casein. And in this setting, um, almost no cancer in the mice, but with HPV at 22% casein, is about 100% of them. So the big point of this is the more dominant um, thing right here in these mice studies was the presence of casein as a tumor promoter, which is thought to be due to the animal protein increasing growth factors like insulin-like growth factor, for example, uh, increased activation of mTOR mammalian targeted rapamycin, uh, perhaps in a fat animal, a combination fat and animal protein effect of increased insulin, which is also mitogenic. Um, okay, so then the next one is HPV in, um, with, in humans. When he did the China study, the observation was made was a lot of persons had hepatitis B, but the ones who ate more animal protein were more prone to getting um, liver cancer. And the ones that ate less animal protein, despite also having HPV, were less likely to get liver cancer. And the similar things have been seen. If you look at Japan, for example, lots of cigarette smokers, not that much lung cancer in the 1950s and 60s compared with America, because the Americans were eating lots of high fat food and they had high cholesterol. They had lots of lung cancer. They're smokers. Same thing with the Papua New Guinea. Lots of smokers, but all they ate was sweet potatoes, low cholesterols, um, and they also didn't eat, you know, hardly any animal protein, not much lung cancer. So that's kind of an interesting thing. Okay, just sort of a historical background that relates to the work of T. Colin Campbell. Otto Warburg had shown, you know, back as early as 1910, his work began to show this, that mitochondria are irreversibly injured by hypoxia. Hypoxia is just lack of oxygen, and this can initiate cancer. The, the cell will de-differentiate instead of being part of an organ system. This was in tissue culture, so it was done in vitro. In vitro means in glass, meaning outside of a live animal body versus in vivo is in a live animal body. So anyways, um, he showed that hypoxia was the primary event for his laboratory in causing cancer. Um, that that could induce some change that he felt was irreversible. Then uh, Peter Kuo and Roy Swank both showed in the late 1900s that a high-fat meal causes tissue hypoxia. Michael Brownlee uh, with the Banting Lecture 2004, that uh, paper is available online, the Unifying Theory of Diabetic Complications, showed how dietary fat impairs mitochondrial function and initiates insulin resistance. So you've got injury to mitochondria, first of all, above by hypoxia induced by high dietary fat. And then secondly, there's another mechanism of uh, dietary fat damaging mitochondria um, and it's a metabolic cause as demonstrated in the paper of Michael Brownlee and also the work of Gerald Sheldman has also shown the same thing with nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy to look in a cell and the earliest uh, finding that's detectable for causation of insulin resistance is increased lipid inside of skeletal muscle cells intermyocellular lipid okay then here T. Colin Campbell showed that cancer cells in mice and rats have a memory they have a memory in the sense that once a person has cancer, they always have cancer. And what that means is a lot of people have had great outcomes and they've been doing well for years, but if they drift back into their bad habits, like eating a lot of junk food, smoking cigarettes and stuff, the cancer will come back and they'll die, okay? And next time around, they might not be able to do anything to slow it down. So that's a relevant point that, uh, you know, cancer, it goes dormant. It doesn't necessarily disappear. You know, there might be some persons in who it disappears, but in a lot of people, it's dormant. So whatever good habits are keeping them healthy, keep going with those good habits. Get a lot of exercise, get your sleep, manage your stress, etc. cetera. Um, another key point T. Colin Campbell showed with his research was that the tumor promoter was more important 
than the carcinogen. A carcinogen is something that causes a DNA mutation. So that's called tumor cancer initiation. First phase of cancer is cancer initiation to damage DNA, causing mutation, for example. Hypoxia can do that. Carcinogens like aflatoxin can do that. Viruses can do that, like hepatitis B. Okay. The second thing is tumor promotion, something that causes the cell to divide. Because if this tumor is just carcinogenic, meaning it's got damaged DNA that's potentially going to make a tumor, it doesn't do anything, fine, so what? It's when it starts growing. And so a tumor promoter is something that speeds up growth in a cancer cell. And T. Colin Campbell felt animal protein was the most powerful tumor promoter in his experience on all his animal studies. And there's suggestive data from the China study of his observational epidemiology study that suggests that increased animal protein also increases cancer risk. And then in other cancers, it's pretty well known, increased animal protein is associated with increased breast cancer. It's associated with increased colon cancer, um, increased prostate cancer. And then we get into the whole hormonal issues with uh, estrogen and whatnot. So that's a topic for another day. Um, but everybody's been exposed to carcinogens. And um, everybody has some cancer cells in their body. So in my opinion... I think the smart move is that everybody should eat a low-fat, low-sodium vegan diet. T. Colin Campbell would agree with that. Um, he actually does think that saturated fat is sort of scapegoated, blame for some of the problems that are actually caused by animal protein. And he feels that if you look at a chart where you can plot saturated fat as being linearly, directly proportional to cancer, he's like, well, you could just as easily uh, plot an animal protein or cholesterol that... What he's basically saying is saturated fat and cholesterol, which is only present in animal food, are like surrogate markers for animal protein. Fair enough. Um, he also feels that saturated fat is relatively inert because it doesn't have any double bonds, and he thinks that saturated fat gets blamed for more things than it deserves, is his opinion. Um, he also thinks that nuts are a reasonably good food as long as a person you know, doesn't have an issue with the fat. So that's where he differs a little bit from, let's say, T. Colin Camp. That's where T. Colin Campbell differs a little bit from Caldwell Esselstyn, for example. Caldwell Esselstyn will tell his patients, no nuts. And, you know, Caldwell Esselstyn will say, well, he's dealing with patients that have high coronary artery disease risk or even have proven coronary artery disease. And that's why he's so strict, so to speak, on recommending people avoid nuts and avocados, uh, for example. And, you know, I would say basically, like William C. Roberts, MD, the cardiac pathologist, had said, when you take herbivores and you feed them a high-fat diet, they all get atherosclerosis, every single one of them, 100%. And so basically anybody who's eating the standard American diet, by the time they're 40, they've got atherosclerosis of variable severity. Um, they've even shown it in significantly younger persons. Uh, so what I'm saying is I think you know, any man over 40 should assume he's got atherosclerosis and optimize his diet accordingly. Um, and women, they start catching up postmenopausal. Their, their menstruation every month protects them. It's a therapeutic phlebotomy. We'll talk about that in other lectures. I already have, but um, right after postmenopause or if they get a hysterectomy, women's risk of atherosclerosis dramatically, rapidly goes way up. Um, let's see what else was interesting about China study. Um, average total cholesterol in China was about 127. Uh, T. Colin Campbell thinks it probably ideally would be even 90. Some people get it down there. Some counties have an average around that amount. There were a bunch of different counties in China that were studied in the China study. What was happening was the leader of China in the 19, early 1970s had cancer, was dying of cancer, and then uh, approved of this giant uh, epidemiologic research study. And T. Colin Campbell went to China, worked with the Chinese scientists, and they did this incredible China study. It's one of the most extraordinary epidemiologic nutrition studies ever done. Uh, some other interesting things. The average uh, Western uh, diet eating female has five, at least five times more breast cancer than does a woman in China. Um, and the average onset of menarche in China is about 17 years old. In, in America, it's about 11 years old. And it's from a different diet. You know, the high meat diet, it's got more estrogens in it, maybe tap water issues as well. But, you know, longer un unopposed estrogen in life increases uh, breast cancer risk. The biggest difference in the diets between the Chinese and the Americans was the Chinese were eating a lot more plant foods. All right, well, that covers it for T. Colin Campbell, nutrition hero and um, great nutrition expert and especially great expert on uh, protein.